Hello, Warren. It's a pleasure to have you here in Spain. And uh, I would like to put some questions, to do some questions uh, that would be very important for the school now and in the future. Well, first, uh, how did your first awakening of the teaching come about? I suppose when I was a child, I had a very devout grandfather, Safadi, old Safadi, and I was always aware of this other dimension. And when I was a child, I was always fascinated in the fairy stories, not by the heroes, but by the magicians. People like Merlin, this, this always led me to look, what did they know that the other people didn't know? And this always fascinated me. They obviously had access to some body of knowledge. I didn't know this consciously. But I recall having certain ideas, for example, when I lived in the country during the war, I was stealing some apples from the orchard. And I remember saying, I will never become a messiah because I was stealing apples. I'm not good enough to become a messiah. Yes. How could an eight-year-old boy know about the concept of messiah? It obviously has to do with the memory of another, another life. Another... So there was knowledge inside me which I was unconscious, which I brought with me. And I can recollect, just before I was born, there were three people. They said to me, so you're bored up here? I said, it's very interesting, but down here's where the action is, where I'd want to be. So I, I feel I always had a mission. I didn't know what it was consciously, but it was only later that became apparent. Mm -hmm. And uh, who has been your inspiration? Sorry? Who has been your inspiration? Well, I've had a large number of teachers, many of whom did not realize they were my teachers, but I realized this was Providence talking to this person, working for that person. Uh, for example, I, I didn't do military service, but I did service in the hospital. And I was a porter, very high rank, he was to carry the patients along. But I had a boss, who was like my sergeant major, and he taught me how to wait. How to wait, to be patient, and how to observe. And I had many teachers, but I suppose the one who's given me the greatest inspiration was the, the medieval poet and philosopher uh, Ibn Gibiro, who was a Safadi. And he's always been my sort of inspiration. He wrote a, a, a great poem called uh, Ketabalkut, which in fact is the ladder, but it's in very poetic form. And that really sort of touched my heart very much. So, so he was always been a sort of inspiration, Ibn Gibiro. Ibn Gibiro. Yeah. How did you come to realize your work in this life? Well, like I was an art student and I wanted to be a painter. Uh, and I realized that I was caught between two ways of seeing the world. One was through images, and the other one was through words. And when I was working in the hospital, I would get to know a sketchbook on one side and a text on the other. And one of my uh, fellow students said, you know, Warren, you're much more of a writer than a painter. And she was right. And I realized I could, I could catch, I think so, I saw somebody die. You can't draw somebody who died, but you could describe them. The moment up to the point where suddenly the person's no longer there. This you could actually put in text in time. You can't get that in a painting. So I became more and more interested in the passing moment, the developing moment. So I moved more and more away from being an artist. Well, I never ceased to be an artist, but to be much more of a writer. And of course, I wanted to write the great English novel. And I wrote, I think, 12 novels. They were terrible, absolutely romantic, philosophical rubbish. And I burned the wall well after doing the dust because they were so bad. And uh, one of my teachers said, write about what you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I worked in the theatre for many years. So I wrote two books on the theatre, which I did know. Mm -hmm. And I got them published. Then I realised that what I really was interested in writing about was about mystical philosophy. And I was in a school of the soul where we studied normal psychology and cosmology. And while I was there, I met somebody who introduced me to Kamala, and I realized I was home. This was my own Jewish tradition, and it took me much further than the philosophical school. And the whole thing suddenly opened right up. This was probably in my <coughs> mid-30s. But I suddenly realized this was a whole world that I knew. I remember it, I knew. And uh, one of the connections is to do with Tolaine, which uh, 
while I was about ten, I was looking through a book in the encyclopedia. There was a little TV picture of Torino. And I said, I was only ten. I must go there. I must go there. I must go there. I don't know why. I must go there. And when I was twenty, I was a student. I went to Torino in 1951. And it was how I knew the streets. It was so familiar. I didn't know then why. Years later, when my father said, well, you're a safari. We were safari. I didn't realize that. And I realized the whole thing fell into place, Kabbalah, because Kabbalah is essentially a very Spanish uh, philosophical way of approaching things. So the whole thing sort of opened up. And what is it for you to be a Kabbalist? It's a great pleasure. Um, it means I enjoy my hobby. I enjoy what I love doing. It brings me into contact with lots of people. And I, I love people. They're very interesting. But I love my solitude. Uh, I can travel to Mexico or South Africa or Australia or Europe or the Americas. And it's, I can meet all sorts of interesting people. And, you know, for example, you and I were in Japan. We had a Mexican, an English Jew. Uh, a Japanese, somebody from Israel, say, this is a wonderful club, and we're all Kabbalists. And people sometimes say to me, but you, know, you, you include non-Jews. And I said, because the Jewish mission is to be a light unto the nations. That our task in the Western world is to show that this teaching lays behind, this is the teaching which makes the Bible so powerful. And it is not exclusively Jewish. It is meant to go into the world to help humanity. So this almost made great sense, and it's an enormous pleasure to do the Holy One's work. This is what I was supposed to do. Yes. To me, this makes sense. Lord, um, what are the reasons that this school of the soul is called the Toledano tradition? Well, it goes back to what I said, that my feeling of being at home in Toledo. Now, Toledo in the Middle Ages was where Muslims and Jews Christians met in what's called the Comibienza, that they had a convivial relationship where they would talk philosophy, they would not talk religion, they would talk philosophy, metaphysics, usually male platonic, and they would each take away to Sufism or Christian mysticism, or in our case, Kabbalah, this metaphysical approach. Now, at that particular point, <clears throat> in the West, because they'd lost the Romano Hellenic condition, this, this Hellenic approach towards philosophy and mysticism came together in the form of Kabbalah. And it was where the three Abrahamic religions worked together. And I think at the present time, in the 21st century, we have a similar situation. So I work with Sufis, I work with Christian mystics, and to me, we're trying to bring about that unity at a higher level. And the Tulaidano tradition really is saying, remember the time when we were all together, we were working together. It's absolutely essential. Also, one of the things I see is very important is that we take a tradition like this and we modernize it. Now, in the Middle Ages, they brought philosophy. And that was the modernization. And there was tremendous resistance against bringing in metaphysics and the psychology of the time. And even today, I have a resistance to bringing in contemporary science and contemporary psychology. But this is the language of our time. So I feel the way for example, we have one of our group who is working inside Christian mysticism, the others working inside Muslim mysticism, who had the trade, a Kabbalistic trade, where they could take the principles which are beyond culture, which are beyond religion. And as Plotinus said, he was a, an early uh, metaphysician and mystic, he said, there's no religion higher than truth. And that has always been my criteria. There's no religion higher than truth. The Torah, the teaching, it's not the law, it's the teaching about why existence exists and what our purpose is. That we are the eyes and ears of the Holy One. In the process of self-realization at the personal level and at the collective level. And our school, along with various other schools, is to raise that level. Help raise that level for this particular generation and perhaps for the next two or three hundred years. Until what we're doing goes out of fashion. If the language is no longer intelligible, and then a new wave will come. And perhaps who knows, we'll be back talking in 500 years' time, having the same conversation. Well, hopefully. Yeah. So the, the Kuwait Alfred is simply a name for the coming together of the three Abrahamic traditions in particular. But uh, we were in Japan recently, 
and talking to Shinto priests, who said, oh, we recognize this. And so there's a kind of international consensus among the esoteric community who uh, communicate. I, for example, I've had in the last two weeks, I've had three, uh, two Buddhist nuns and one Buddhist monk coming to see me to talk about psychology and metaphysics. Mm. It's, the culture may be different, but the essential uh, regards the human psyche and existence is exactly the same. And we're in a period where the humanity has to get together, otherwise it will destroy itself. We are very close to a dangerous period where we have to shift levels. So that is also partly what our work is about. Yeah, oh no. I think so. Maybe let's do another question. Um, how do you envision the school developing in the future world? It's difficult to say. All we can do is plant seeds. We've got groups, now we've got groups in Sweden. We've got them in Belgium, Holland, uh, we have them in course, Mexico, in Canada, uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. We've got them, of course, in Spain and Portugal. We are slowly spreading. The books are now in 14 different languages. They're in Hungarian, they're in Greek, and we hope that to sow the seeds. The books are written to be used basically by people who want to study Kabbalah in small groups. It doesn't matter where they are. And uh, people sometimes write to me or come and see me say, we're a little group somewhere in the middle of nowhere. We can use your books as a working method. So I think our job is to scatter seeds. That's our job. And I see we're a, a teacher's training college, which you're an example. Yes. That people come and study with us, get the principles, and they go away and they work within their own culture. So I foresee that we, <coughs> we scatter seeds. And we, we will not see the fruits. But it doesn't matter. I think that's our job. Uh, Warren, and would you like to add something else uh, for this interview? What else? Uh, I think that's really a, a pretty good summation of uh, what I would like to say. I mean, if you've got any further questions, anybody here has got any further questions. <laughs> well, uh, so, well, thank you very much, Warren, and uh, I hope this uh, interview will go to many people who could understand in the future the work you are doing in this lifetime. I, I hope it will, because I think this knowledge is vital, not only to individual, but collective development and survival. And the Kabbalah has carried through the ages this body of knowledge, yes. and it needs to come out. It no longer needs to be secret. The, the important thing is people say it's secret, it's not a secret, it's not, it, people don't recognize it. But we're putting it, hopefully, in an intelligible form where people can actually make use of it, because it's a very practical, down-to-earth tradition. The Jewish tradition is in the marketplace, in all the worlds. So we've got, we've got this job to do. And I'm simply, I come from a Levite family, I come from a rabbinical family, and that's our job. And I'm doing what my job is supposed to do. Well, Warren, thank you very much. To Darabha, thank you very much. And thank you very much.